Good afternoon and welcome to 22 News in Focus. I'm Ciara Speller. The average person will work somewhere around 92,000 hours in their lifetime. If you started work at age 18 and retire at 68, that's 50 years. But most of us won't be working all that time at just one company. That's a lot of time spent in an environment and surrounded by people that you have little to no control over. One of those top reasons that people leave a job is because of a negative workplace environment, which could include poor leadership, a bullying boss or coworkers, and inadequate training or support. Today on 22 News in Focus, we'll be looking at ways to create a positive workplace culture that can improve communications, productivity among employees and customers. Joining me now is Gina DiStefano, president and CEO of the DiStefano Group, a company that specializes in executive business marketing, coaching and people development. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Gina. Mm, thank you for having me. So first of all, what exactly is business coaching? What is it that you do every day? That's a great question. I just want to start with what it's not. People hear the word coaching and they think rah rah and you come in and you build morale and you team building and that's like a little part of it but really what we do at the DiStefano Group it's more figuring out the underlying issues of why your company isn't being run the way you want it to and what is lacking in leadership to make sure that things start to run properly. And what kinds of training do you offer? We offer quite a bit of training. It's really hard to pinpoint <laughs> things. You know, it's the great thing about what we do too is it's really uh, an assessment on the individual company and we make sure to customize to everything before we apply the trainings that we have. Something that we are known for is our SUU system that we have trademarked, which is really the underlying foundation to get all companies working efficiently. So let's talk about the kind of businesses that you help. We help all types of businesses. We are lucky that we have five amazing coaches on staff on top of our VP and Chief Marketing Officer. So typically we do work with much larger companies, but we are equipped to help the mom and pops, the small mid-sized businesses. But we do a lot of work with larger companies and we work across the country. We're not just in Western Mass. Okay, and is there a difference between coaching and mentoring? There's a huge difference in coaching and mentoring and I always say too, coaching really isn't for the week because it's a huge accountability piece. It's really a leader stepping up saying I'm ready to look at what I need to look at, do the work I need to do and strategically co-create with a coach to make that happen and there's, it's, it's a lot of work. It's, it's a lot of time. It's a complete investment because you're investing in yourself and your people whereas mentoring is more of kind of someone that you look up to, someone to give you some advice, point in the right direction, whereas coaching is much more strategic and um, detail oriented. And so when these businesses come to you, you know, what are they usually seeking? What are some of their main concerns? Uh, the biggest concern is their people and productivity and why aren't people doing it and we've trained them and we've taught them and they they want things fixed. They want to get better results through their people, but unfortunately they don't know, they don't have the tools on how to do that. So that is the absolute first piece. I always say it's leader led top down. And if the leader isn't strong and confident and knowing what they're doing, there's absolutely no way they can trickle that down and have their people execute the way they want them to. And so are there you know, exercises that leaders can do to make sure that they're doing what they need to do? <laughs> it goes a little <laughs> beyond exercises. It's more about first and foremost, the awareness for the leader. I, like I said, top down, it's always leader led. So it's first about kind of breaking down the leader and, and getting an idea of what's going on, what's going right, what's going wrong. And then we go through the people. It's not about the leader, it's about listening to your people and understanding where they're coming from and their perspective. And everyone is different. So it's about getting this leader strong enough to know how to acclimate to all different personalities and get the results they want. It's not done through a team building exercise. It's not done, you know, sending them off to a 48 hour coaching leadership training and then expecting them to come back and know it's ongoing. It's, it's a lot of work. It's very involved. And let's talk about goals. How important is it for a business owner or management to clarify their vision or their goals? It is so imperative and that's the biggest opportunity right there is they think they know or they think they're being clear until they have that neutral third party come in and an experienced coach to say it might be clear to you. It might be clear to the people that sit at that executive table with you, but it's not clear to your people and they're the most important ones that need to get it. So before we really go about putting on new expectations, it's most important to get the clarity from your people that they understand. So let's talk about the steps for setting and implementing goals then. Steps for setting via the leader? 
for the for the <laughs> leader or for the employee as well you know I always say too it's, it's a it's a combined effort it's not a one woman man show to do it it's about listening understanding how to conduct um, one-on-one -on -one conversations of substance with your people really getting to know them it's about knowing how to do roundtables it's about knowing how to collect the feedback from your people to create realistic goals that they can actually execute with excitement so there are a lot of steps involved I'm trying to break down and like simplify yeah. but there's a lot that leads up to that and so what's the best way for you know setting up those goals as you were talking about roundtable discussions is that something that you find a lot of people benefit from or are there different you know ways to go about it it's about really knowing how to meet people where they are and getting to know your people and that is what we've created the CU system around and our CU system stands for special understood and excited so if you can get your people and your team to feel special understood and excited to be around you they're going to want to work for you they're going to want to produce they're going to want to go the extra mile and this goes across the board I always say we don't have two separate buckets in life you don't have a personal life and a professional life At the end of the day everybody wants to feel that way so when you can learn and it is a system that you have to learn because everybody will say oh I sue people all the time I recognize my people I appreciate them no you don't pizza Fridays is not suing someone beanbag chairs in the in the break room is not suing someone that you know that is not really making people feel excited to carry out your vision and you have to you absolutely have to get people to feel that way because if they just feel like their only job is to contribute to the, your bottom line, they just end up being your paycheck collectors. Yeah, and so suing, for our viewers just joining us now, could you explain what that is? Sure, the sue you system is a way that you make people feel special, understood, and excited to be around you. And it's the truth. I mean, think about the people in your life that you do, um, that you just feel good around, and you listen to, and you want to go above and beyond for them. But you really have to get to know someone in order to do that. And it's about... When people feel that they are important and they're valued, they go above and beyond. It's about empowering people, and that's a leader's number one job is to empower other people, not to inflate their ego, not to be the hero. It's about being vulnerable, it's about servant leadership, and it's about putting your people first. And unfortunately, a lot of leaders don't know how to do that. So talking about putting your people first, how important is it for employee and clients to input uh, in setting and reaching their goals? to include their input rather they should be a hundred percent they should be telling you what they're really good at it should be a co-creation it shouldn't just be a finger pointing I hired you for this it has to be about what excites you what motivates you and trying to interject that along with their role so that they're doing it with actual excitement and it's a process and it takes time and it's a tool that needs to be coached to these leaders and how about what is people development people development my definition of people development is just that it's being able to hone in on an individual and pulling out their strengths and what makes them thrive and a good leader can do that that is people development and unfortunately a lot of individuals get placed into a position of power not because they're good at developing others but because they're good at their craft they're a good attorney so they open up a firm and you know now they have associates and paralegals and admins and they're great at being an attorney but not at that people development piece or you are a great engineer so you get promoted and before you know it you're overseeing 10 engineers but you don't know how to oversee people you only know how to be good at your craft so there's that's probably the biggest opportunity right there that we need to hone in on is really teaching leaders how to be leaders and so lastly you know we were talking about a positive workplace environment what does that look like it's not about what it looks like it's about what does it feel like right and a positive what now did you say positive work environment or toxic work environment? positive positive yes. <laughs> um, a positive work environment is first you can look at the measurables you can look at your retention you can look at your turnover you can look at the energy and that I'm sorry look you can feel it and you can, right. and you can see it that's positive you know it's the same thing with negative it's common sense you know when people are not happy there's chatter there's there's a lot of conflict and leaders and people don't know how to do the conflict resolution and so they think by doing things like um, team building activities and we took everyone to Six Flags or we have you know lunches that that's not culture that's not a feeling that's not exciting people yeah, and just quickly how about some negative toxic things that people could maybe identify in a workplace Oh, there's so many <laughs> that's a whole other <laughs> segment I think the negative is just people feeling um, that when they speak up 
it's not going to be followed through. They're not going to be heard. So what happens is there's way more chatter in the background. And we all know that. And you have that leader who's sitting in there thinking, oh, everything's going great. It's because in your eyes they are because no one's ever going to come to you and tell you the truth of the situation, which is the great thing about what we do is the DeStefano group, group, we're really good at building trust and rapport quickly. We are really great at finding out the core issue and fixing it. We don't dance around the problem. We don't um, just side with the leader all the time. Our job is to protect the company and make the people happy so that they can produce. And that's what we are passionate about, and that's what it takes to really make a difference. All right, thank you, Gina. Creating a positive workplace is an essential element for a successful business. After the break, we'll discuss some strategies to address conflict and negative environments. You're watching 22 News in Focus. Today, we're talking about creating a positive workplace environment and setting goals for your business and employees. I'm talking with Gina DiStefano, president and CEO of the DiStefano Group. That's a company that specializes in executive business and marketing coaching and people development. So, Gina, what are some signs that a workplace culture is toxic? It's that feeling, it's just that knowing. And we can walk in, and we've been doing this for so long, and just and just feel it. It's an energy of people that are not getting along well. It's, it's people that are calling out. It's just people don't want to be there. And you can feel that, and you know it. And how about approaching this with your clients? This is, it's very challenging, because no leader wants to hear that they're failing. But the truth is, they are, and it's OK, because it's top-down leader-led. It's about accountability. It's about being vulnerable and saying, something's off. I don't know how to communicate with my people. I don't know how to get the results I need to get. I'm scared. I don't know what to do. Help me. And what are some steps that you found have worked with your clients to improve the workplace? The biggest steps is raising their awareness and getting them to be comfortable with being uncomfortable and being vulnerable and letting us do what we need to do. And we have phenomenal clients, and I'm always so impressed by the clients that have the strength and the courage to say, help me out, because our clients range all over the place, very, very successful businesses. And it doesn't mean that a client, our clients are not struggling financially. It's more they're struggling from that people piece that they want to create great cultures and create great environments and do everything they can. So that, to me, shows very, very strong leadership when you are, your company is financially successful, but you're still saying something's just not right, and it starts with me, and I'm willing to fix it. Right, so we've all been in a situation where we might not be getting along with our manager. What would you suggest? How would you approach that? It's very hard because when I coach, too, and when we coach, we coach both sides. We are working for the employee just as much as we are for the owners and the leaders. So I always recommend to employees, First of all, follow the chain of command if there is one. There's no need to run to the president right away. If you have a supervisor, you go to the supervisor. If you're not comfortable with that, you find a different avenue. But there's also always power in numbers. So if you're feeling something and your peers are feeling the same, more people, more power with it. But I also always encourage, because I play both sides of the fence, no leader just wants problems being brought to them. So if you can get a group together, have a solution. Say, hey, boss, this is what's going on. This is how we're feeling. But we have some ideas of how to change that. That way, the supervisor is much more open and not feeling attacked and on defense. So there are strategic ways to go about this. But number one, follow the chain of command. If you're not comfortable with your supervisor, go to their supervisor. But also, try to get your peers and other people together that might be sharing the same feeling and bring the solution along with the concern. Now, how about a good worker that doesn't get along with other employees. What could a manager do to address that? We really need to find out why, because regardless of the results that this person is getting, if they're getting them without the correct behavior and causing toxicity in the work environment, we need to address that. So this is, again, where a leader needs to be really strong, figure out the problem. And if it is that person and they just are a cancer to the environment, you're going to have to get rid of that employee. You're going to have to coach and counsel them out because it doesn't matter the results. If they can't get along and they're causing detriment to the culture, they need to go. What are some conflict resolution strategies that you suggest to your clients that they can use with their employees and customers? <sighs> Always approach everything with kindness, empathy, and meet people where they are. 
and that is hard when emotions are high and we're struggling with customers or clients or employees. Our first means of defense is to attack or to protect yourself and it really just means meeting them where they are. What is this really about? I understand you're upset. There's, there's definitely words and tools and, that can be taught to diffuse situations. But another big thing that plays into all of this that I, I learned early on in my career was the experience of the employee should never exceed that of the customer. And so often leaders and owners, they want to go after their customer and make them happy, and they overlook their employee. But how can the employee deliver a great experience to a customer if they're not happy? So it's not about blaming your employee. It's about what are you doing or not doing to make them feel special, interested, and excited so that they're trickling that over and they're doing that to your customer. It's not about the customer. It's about your employee. And people forget that. So now let's talk about the customer a little bit. Sometimes a customer could come across as demanding and difficult to please. So how can you address the customer's needs or concerns without the fear of losing their business? I always say it's, it's really so simple, but it's not easy. When I say meet people where they are, it's, it's understand, yes, you're upset. You should be upset. And what are we going to do to fix the situation? Take eyes out of it. Take eye statements. Take emotion out of it. And what do you need from me to make this better? What could I have done different? When somebody feels that you're actually working with them and beside them, things go so much smoother than coming at somebody from an authoritative perspective or telling somebody why they're wrong and you're right. And how important is it having a good relationship with the community and the neighborhood where you have your business? It's huge because let let your community be your advocates. I mean, we have so much amazing things you can do with social media and marketing to get your business out there, but nothing will ever replace kindness. Nothing will ever replace getting out to the community and, and talking to people and greeting them and suing them. And you can't do that over social media. You can't do that with technology. You can do that with being a good person. And when you do that and you have that experience on someone, your community becomes your marketing. They become your advocates. They're talking about you because of the way you made them feel. And what are some of the ways that you can involve employees participating in community-centered events? I love this question because <laughs> it, again, go back to your employees and ask them, what do you like to do? What excites you? Do you love animals? Do you love reading? Do you love books? OK, well, let's go out to the community and go towards those industries, and then we'll figure out how to get our product in there. But if you're passionate about where you're going and what you're doing, you're going to bring to life your product or your business of what you're trying to sell versus me saying, OK, I'm going to need you to go knock on all of these doors and do this, this, and this, and say this, and I hand you a script. But if you're not passionate about that script, if you don't want to be knocking on those doors, and then I'm going to get mad at you for it, <laughs> instead right. of saying, how are we going to work together? Like, I know nobody likes to cold call or knock on doors, right. but well, what are we going to do to make this fun for you? Like, what about this can, can get you excited to do it? Right. It's about open dialogue and conversations. And we forget that because we're so busy focused on our bottom line and the numbers and the results. And if we just focused a little more on the people piece of what's going to actually excite and motivate someone to do it, they'll go above and beyond for you. So making sure that your employees' voices are heard, that some of their passion can come into play to make sure that they can get the job done. Absolutely, because we can't all make our passion our paycheck, and that's okay. But what you can do is take your passions and bring it to work to make work more fun and enjoyable, to not only for you, but for everyone you surround yourself with, because everything is energy. And you want to be that person. You sue people, people sue you back, and things get much better. Environments get much, much, much more enjoyable to work in. And so do you think you know, doing things outside of the workplace as well can help foster better relationships? Yes and no. Let's be <laughs> honest. Um, I'm going to go until you really know you have a solid culture. Absolutely not. The last thing people want to do after a long day at work or you're on a retreat or something or at a conference is hang out with people at work. They don't. And I don't know where leaders go because I don't even think the leaders want to be there. So we just had, you know, a full day. So let's go do a scavenger hunt. Right. No. What I want to do is go and order takeout and watch Netflix. That's what I want to do. Right. Or I want to go be with my family or my friends or I just want to take a bath. I don't. You can't force it. That is not team building. If anything, it's going to build a team stronger against leadership because they're going to kind of, what's the word, bond over how bad the situation is and how they don't want to be there. Right. So sorry, leaders, but 
outside stuff, not not always what you think it's going to be or the results right. isn't okay. <laughs> always positive. All right, Gina DiStefano, thank you. And we'll continue our conversation when we return. You're watching 22 News in Focus. Today, we're talking about creating a positive workplace environment and addressing some issues of physical and mental wellness in the workplace. Gina, how can an employer determine if there's a toxic work environment? An employer knows there's a toxic environment if they don't feel that they can speak openly and truthfully and, and remove the elephant from the room. And they, when you feel that way in any situation in life, when you're holding back, you're in a toxic environment. It's pretty clear. And let's talk about communication. How important is communication between workers and management and then workers and clients? It's all equally important. And people throw around the phrase, you know, excellent communication skills and we communicate. And communication goes far beyond being articulate or being a chatty Cathy or being able to talk to anyone. Communication is the ability to remove the elephant from the room. And that is hard. It's hard to address issues that nobody wants to talk about, to get right down to the core of it. Most people want to dance around it. Most people want to band-aid it. So by teaching those strategies of how to remove the elephant, it is equally important that an employee can speak to a manager that way, manager relates to customers, the whole, the whole circle of people involved. And what are some strategies um, or what types of conflict and resolution practices can be used? I think the most important is making sure that you are having the right tools and that often does involve hiring coaches, hiring a neutral third party to first help you remove all the emotion because that's what we do. We go after people either personally or professionally based on who we think they are, based on the prior, prior experiences we've had with them. So it's really hard for us to go into situations neutral. So sometimes, just like anything, a coach, a therapist, someone's got to come in and kind of level the playing ground until everyone is calm and ready to look at it from other people's perspectives. So it's, it's really about teaching those tools first. And if you don't have them, you've got to reach out and get help for it. And there's nothing wrong with it. The best companies, the strongest leaders, myself included, coaches have coaches. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a weakness. It's a strength to say, I'm not on my game. Why did I feel like I could have handled that situation better? And now I have to fix it. And that means going outside and, and hiring and, and getting the people, the right people involved to help you with it. And now what are some strategies to work toward team building and creating a positive <clears throat> work environment? Baby steps. It's, it, it takes time. And the thing with doing something like this is it's definitely not overnight. It's like going to the gym. You don't go one day for 10 hours and have that perfect body. In fact, the most annoying thing about the gym is it takes you quite a while. And then one day, six months later, someone says, wow, you look great. Have you been working out? And you're like, yeah, for the last six months every day at 4 a.m. But it takes time even for yourself to start to gradually see it and see it. And it's the same thing with building that culture. It first starts with the leader doing little things consistently and following up and following through. Because when there is mistrust in a workplace, it takes a long time to get it back. It doesn't happen overnight. And they have to be invested and involved and stick with it. And then eventually you do see amazing shifts. And how much does the physical building have to do with creating a welcoming and healthy working environment? It definitely plays a huge part. It's, once again, it's about listening to your people. Now, obviously, lots of companies don't have the funds to do, you know, a scrape and rebuild and state of the art, this or that. But it's little things that if, if somebody feels more comfortable, if a beanbag chair or, or stand-up desk or making sure there's lactation facilities, lactation rooms available, just little things to make that space more comfortable for them to work in, the employer absolutely has to listen and have flexibility. But once again, this goes to a street. It's not just going to your employer and saying, this is awful, and this is awful, and this is awful. It's about saying, um, what do you think if I brought my dog to work, would that be OK? What do you think if I did a 10-minute meditation in the break room once a day? Is that just bring the solution to make the space more comfortable? And it's about everybody working together. And so what? you know, have you seen when employers will go to their management and maybe suggest something like that? Is it usually something that can, you know, be worked on or? It's all in the delivery because I absolutely, from the 
owner leader, all I hear is, how much more can I give? And money, 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 money. And what? Blah, 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 blah. Because it's not being communicated. And all the employees are saying is, wow, look at the boss. They're rolling in dough because they don't know that they're not, <laughs> that they have huge overhead and costs. So it's about the delivery and that, that common ground, again, where a neutral third party can help with that. I can get the employees to see that, no, just because they're the president of the company doesn't mean that they have a money tree in the back. But I can also get the owner or leader to say, you got to listen to your people and help them out because they're driving your bottom line. They're the ones who are making your money. You got to listen to them. And you got to meet them halfway. You have to meet them where they are. And it's really, again, simple but not easy. It's about people willing to be open and vulnerable and find common ground. And so what if there's, um, you know, an employee, maybe they're a little timid, but there's a suggestion that they'd really like to have heard. Would you maybe suggest just having a suggestion box or some way to go about it so that they don't have to actually physically you know bring this to their manager absolutely because those are great things too because you have a lot of people and you don't have to be a boisterous extrovert to be heard but if you tend to be more introverted or quiet and you want to be heard but these are skills that a good leader will be able to pull out of people and create the environment so I can't stress enough it's leader led top down that you don't band-aid things by just throwing a suggestion box in the corner. It's about how do I need to talk to Sally differently than Tom to get her ideas and make her feel safe. It all comes down to that leadership and that leader knowing how to develop those skills. And what approaches do you use when you work with a company that's struggling with low morale, high turnover, and other indicators of a poor work environment? You go to their people. We go to the people. We listen to the people first and we get incredible feedback from that of people saying to us we didn't even know how badly we needed you until you were here because of experiences they've had with other coaches or business coaches coming in solely focusing on the leader and the numbers and the operations of the company we also absolutely look at all of those things but first and foremost we listen to your people why are they unhappy what will they tell us that they're not telling you that we will get to you and we will fix the problem and we have yet to fail at it and we have yet to have that strategy and our CU system not work. So leader led top down all the time. And how about, how can employees get involved without fear of reprimand? We touched on this a little bit earlier, but you know, how can, how can they get involved? It's, that's like a, a sticky question situation because once in a environment where they feel that they can't speak up, it's gonna be hard to get them to do it because they're either going to leave or they're going to suffer silently and give you mediocre results. So it's, it's up to the leader to spot that and do something about it and not wait for the employee. Because at that point, it's too late. If the employee is scared or doesn't feel comfortable, they're not going to speak up. They're going to leave or, like I said, they're going to give you mediocre results, just enough to not get fired. And so what would you say about maybe an employee emailing their manager because they don't feel comfortable to confront them face to face. You know, some people feel a certain way about emails, but would you say that that's a good way to go about it if it makes that person feel more comfortable? I always say whatever you're comfortable with doing, do it. But once again, if it's gone that far, it doesn't matter the means of communication. It's not going to come across right, especially if that leader already has a feeling or a, a, a preconceived notion about the employee. You're already going at it with some kind of ego or some kind of past experience where the first thing when there is tension and the leader doesn't know how to resolve it is to seek external help. Reach out to someone. Doesn't necessarily even mean hiring a consulting company, even though that would be your best bet. <laughs> it can mean reaching out to your peers, other leaders and companies. Reach out to your network. Ask for help because leaders do want to help other leaders. It's not easy. Leading other people is incredibly challenging. It's draining. It's it's hard and you need that you know, camaraderie of fellow leaders to say, I feel like I'm messing up, help me. And they're gonna look at you and they're gonna say, so am I, so do I, and let's work through this together. And maybe they're then share some strategies about how you get through to your people, but never go at it alone. Never go at it alone. Either hire professionals that can help you or reach out to your network and talk to people that are in the exact same boat you are. All right, Gina DiStefano, thank you so much for being with us today. Mental and physical health play an important role in the workplace. We'll learn more about that dynamic when we return. You're watching 22 News in Focus. Hey, 
we've been talking about creating a positive workplace environment. The dynamics between the employees and each other and with management are essential to creating a welcoming, safe and creative atmosphere. But sometimes physical and mental health issues can create another type of conflict in the workplace. Joining me now is Ken Dolan Del Vecchio, founder and president of Green Gate Leadership. Thank you so much for being with us Great today. Great to be with you, Sarah. So first, tell us about yourself and your background in the mental health fields. Sure, well, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist and licensed clinical social worker. And I went after I got my social work degree to a family therapy training institute because I wanted to be very well prepared. So I went to an institute that was three years in duration and it was great in that it looked at not only the dynamics of relationships, but more importantly, at the center of relationships are dimensions of power. And so one of the things that we really focused on was things like racism and sexism and homophobia and stigma. And so the work that I did as a therapist, and I've worked in many different settings. I've worked in inpatient psychiatry and outpatient services and private practice and voc rehab. But when I came to work in the corporate world, and that was in 1998, I was able to take this systems perspective and put it on the larger system of the workplace. And, and that was truly both a privilege and an adventure. And so what inspired you to start your company? Well, I worked for 19 years in the corporate world. And I loved the work. I loved the development of programs and the consulting with leaders and the, and the counseling and coaching that I did with individuals. But I also wanted to expand my focus and, and be able to do more of what I loved and less of the, shall we say, administrivia. And also, my husband and I wanted to move out of the New Jersey, New York City area and come up here because I'm also passionate about nature and I'm building a permaculture environment and so this was a great place to come and and now I do my speaking I do my consulting I do my advising and I do the the things that I love the most with my clients and so you were the executive responsible for the behavioral health services team that led Prudential to receive we have the American Psychological Association's 2017 organizational organizational excellence award and so tell me about some of the work that led Prudential to receive this distinction. Well, the first thing I want to say is when we talk about creating a mentally healthy workplace, this is really just about having great leadership. Leadership where everybody is seen as a human being and leadership in which it doesn't matter what aspects of our life might be challenges for us whether we live with depression or diabetes or migraines, that it's really okay to be who we are and to come to work and feel like all of us is welcome there. But as you know, there's enormous stigma about mental health. And in fact, the workplace is one of the primary places that stresses people to the point where if they have any predisposition toward depression or anxiety, it may very well come into full life. And so we know that more than half of people will say that work and money are their primary sources of stress. The World Health Organization in 2015 reported that depression is the number one cause of disability worldwide. So prudent companies are taking stock and Prudential has a long history of paying attention to employee health. 1911 was their first health and wellness on-site clinic. And so our leadership team began to look at what are we seeing in terms of stress, depression, obesity, all kinds of other health concerns and putting into place all kinds of programs. The first of which was a definition for health a definition that looks at health in a multidimensional way, so not just physical, but emotional, social, spiritual, financial, with the idea that we should all be empowered to do the things every day that will help us to be at our best possible health within those dimensions. And then, not only at the individual level, and I'm making this little sphere because we, t we look at it as a sphere in our, in our depiction of it, but also that the organization in which we work should be a place that fosters 
our health instead of erodes our health. Every organization is doing one or the other. Mm -hmm. Very important to keep in mind. And so leaders are creating the culture within which their team members perform every day. And it's very important for leaders to do all kinds of things that will support the health of their team members. And then also the company can reach out into the community and do lots of things that are helpful there as well. So very multifaceted. We did all kinds of communications and events and work both internally and with partners externally to do things that would break stigma, normalize the fact that many, many people live with these kinds of conditions, and to, in fact, show, showcase leaders who are willing to talk about their own, their own experiences with depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, and attack this in many different ways. One of the things that's very important to keep in mind is that creating a culture that goes against the norms whether that's mental health stigma or the stigma against trans people or people of color or women, that's a long, long, long-term effort. And it's not, it's not one event where we get together and maybe do some relaxation or we hear from people who are perhaps different from the norm in some way or the mainstream in some way, perceived mainstream, I should say. It's an ongoing, multifaceted effort to create an environment in which everybody's welcome, everybody's included, everybody can be him or herself. And so some leaders say that health is entirely a private matter and should not be a workplace concern. What would you say to that? So you think about the fact that we spend almost all of our waking hours working. Right. Whether we're at a particular work site or we're working remotely or we're at an event where we're representing our company, so the environment in which we live is affecting our health. It's either supporting it, promoting it, empowering our health, or it's degrading it, it's challenging it. Why would you leave that to chance? That's the question that I always give back to any leader who would say that is, why would you, why would you just let that be whatever it may be? And the fact that you're thinking of it in those terms and that you're fragmenting people's experiences in such a way is already an indication to me that there's room for improvement. Right, and so some people you know, might suffer um, both back problems or mm -hmm. like migraines, things like that, and they're comfortable you know, voicing that, but others with you know, mental health disorders aren't so comfortable, and do you think that that comes into play with the, the workplace environment and how they've been treated in the past? Of course it does, and you just think about, you think about this idea of power and how power is applied. In most areas of our life, in most of civilization, power is power over, power as domination. And within that way of looking at power, we're always ranking. What's the better way to be? What's the more healthy? What's the more holy? What's the more right way to be? And so we have men have been empowered over women for forever, and we're fighting that. We see great movement in that direction. White people over people of color. This extends even to the right kind of illness and the not so right kind of. Now why is it okay for, we, for some people to talk about their migraines, their back pain, their cardiac problems, but not the fact that they live with depression or they live with anxiety, which by the way, these mental health conditions are typically very interwoven with any other kind of significant physical, quote unquote, physical mm -hmm. problem. Why can't we mention that we had a rough time with our depression or we had a rough time with our PTSD? And it be expected that that's just part of the human condition. Right. That's just part of life. All right, thank you, Ken, so much. And we'll continue our conversation after the break. You're watching 22 News in Focus. Today on 22 News in Focus, we've been talking about creating a positive workplace environment and addressing the issues of physical and mental wellness in the workplace with Ken Dolan Del Vecchio, founder and president of Greengate Leadership. Ken, when a client contacts you for help, what are the first questions you have for them? What are you looking for? Well, I'm looking for what their need is, whether they want me to come and speak as a starting place, which is often the case, or whether there's a particular issue that's cropped up that they would like to start talking about. 
And really what I'm looking for is what the experience is so far at their workplace and how much of an understanding they have of what it's like to, to be somebody who comes to work at their organization on a day-to-day -day basis. And so what are some of the strategies that you suggest for creating a positive and healthy work environment? Well, there's so many strategies, but it really does start with leaders at the very top level being self-aware and making an effort to connect with the people around them in a way that is welcoming and embracing and clear in their communications and direction. And there's another piece that's incredibly vital, and that is it's important for leaders at all levels, top on down, to have a good idea of what they're asking of their team members in terms of productivity. Because there's so much stress that exists in most of our workplaces. And many times, leaders are so pressured themselves that they don't have a good sense of what they're asking, what's on their team members' plates, really. Because if, if people are overloaded, they begin to have all sorts of problems and show all kinds of difficulties. And let's talk about the physical work environment. How important is lighting, ventilation, cleanliness, things like that for you know, somebody's well-being? Well, we shouldn't work in a filthy environment, right? <laughs> we should work in an environment <laughs> that is pleasant to the eye and the senses. It's important for, for those kinds of baselines to be present. But a lot of times, we kind of work where we do because the environment we work in is geared towards a certain kind of function. And also, the, the organization, depending on its state of development, might not have a lot of money to give to aesthetics. But one of the things that it's important to do is for the employees, the workers in an organization, to be asked periodically, what's it like to work here? Do you have any specific suggestions? I know of one organization where there was concern that people were not enjoying the environment, and they were asked, what, what, what would you like us to do? And almost unanimously, they said, paint the restrooms. Mm. That's what mattered to them. Because when they took a break, they were in an environment that felt like it was just disrespectful right. to them. And let's talk about personnel issues. What do you do if you have a difficult boss? What do you do if you have a difficult Well, we've all had difficult bosses, right? Right. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interject something here that I think is important. One of the things I coach all of the people I work with on is you really have two jobs. You have the job that you're contracted for today, and then you have the job of developing yourself, knowing what your long-term goals are, developing your network, scanning for maybe there's training I should take that would help me develop the skills that will help me move forward. That's the job of stewarding your career. And if you are doing that, you're going to be able to manage whatever sort of adversities come up with greater clarity and decisiveness. But if you have a boss who is a problem in one way or another, the first thing you want to think about is, what, does it make sense to approach the, him or her directly? Does it make sense to talk with him or her directly? In many cases, that's probably something that you're not going to feel like you're going to do because you've probably already tried that, or you've been given signals in many ways that this is somebody who's using their power in a way that is not, they're not open to that. So at first, I think you should try, if it makes sense, to go directly to your supervisor, your boss. If HR, human resources, is functional in your organization, if you see HR is an honest broker and not a rubber stamp for management. And sometimes that's the case, unfortunately. I apologize to my wonderful HR colleagues <laughs> who may be listening. Then you would want to, to speak to human resources. But the, you're in a tight spot. And it shouldn't be that way. Sometimes you want to do a skip step and go to the next person. But this is why it's so important for supervisors and leaders at all levels to cultivate an environment in which people who are on their team experience them as facilitating, as helping. The, the, the best way to use power is to see power not as the right to dominate, but as the responsibility to support shared success. That's power with. 
So we move from power over, which is domination, to power with. This is the thrust of what I try to do with all of the organizations that I work with, that this is what you're looking for. You're looking for an employee experience that feels like I am engaged in a work, in a work mission that I am supported in by the others around me and in certainly by the person who I report to. Right, and so everybody you know, will find something stressful mm -hmm. at their job. Mm -hmm. But what about excessive stress in the workplace? You know, you can't control everything, but that might lead to you, f you know, failing to do your job properly and then having an yes. issue with management. So how should you go about that? Yeah, well, first of all, it's important to know that not all stress is bad. We need, just getting up in the morning is a, a stressful experience in that stress is the experience we have for meeting any challenge. And our temperaments, vary tremendously. So some people are going to feel terribly bored if they're not in an emergency room setting. Other people need to have a predictable environment in which the workflow is something they can foresee. But many, many, many people feel greatly overstressed. And if you do, it's your right to talk about work workload mm -hmm. and expectations. Can I negotiate when this work, this particular piece of work is going to be delivered. Are there pieces of my work that are less important than others that maybe we can put aside? Again, it's important for leaders at all levels to have some idea of what they're asking of the people who report to them so that they know whether it's too much or whether it's reasonable. Okay, so making sure that that uh, line of communication stays open as well. It's, it's, it's so important. All right, thank you so much, Ken. And we'll have the last word for you after the break, so stay with us. You're watching 22 News in Focus. You're watching 22 News in Focus. Today we've been talking about creating a positive workplace environment and addressing the issues of physical and mental wellness in the workplace. That is it for our program today, but we want to thank our guests for joining us. We want to thank you at home for watching. And if you missed any of it, you can watch it in full on our website at WWLP.com. From all of us here at 22 News, we wish you a great day.